We are happy to have with us today, Anne. She will be sharing about the loss of her son, Weston. She also has some facts about fentanyl that she wants to share after that. So, Anne, if you want to go ahead and get started, just um, share your story, if you would, please. Okay. Thank you, Mary, for having me on and letting me share my story. Um, I uh, lost my son, Weston, who was 15 years old um, when he passed, 15 years and three months. Um, he passed in February of 2022 from fentanyl poisoning. He was given a pill um, and he went to bed and never woke up. Um, Weston was a really sweet, really incredible, really happy kid. Um, very, you know, had tons of friends. Um, just a very compassionate kid. I always felt for other people. He wore the weight of the world on his shoulders sometimes. Just really cared about everyone. Um, and you know, he, he really had a way of really just caring for, for, for if people, you know, were sad, he would feel their sadness. If people were, you know, he kind of always felt for everybody around him. He was a really incredible kid like that to the point where people had mentioned to me that the compassion that he had was incredible. Um, from the time that he was born, you know, he made me a mom, he made his father a dad, and he made us a family. I was attached, like, immediately. I'd never wanted to put him down. Um, we were two peas in a pod. He became the foundation of our house. Um, Everything that we did revolved around him. He was, you know, in football and, you know, he liked to play sports. First sport he played was soccer and then little league baseball. And then we put him in football, which he kind of stuck, stuck with for a little while. Um, and then we moved to California and he learned how to surf and he got on the hockey team there. He also played football in, in um, California. And we found a good church um, that was really important to us that we find a good church. Um, we found a good church and we put him in a Christian school there. Um, small school, really warm. We thought, you know, it was going to be the best school for him. And, um, you know, he just, he, he had a great life. We lived in a beautiful guard-gated golf course community overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Wow. Uh, people might think like, well, maybe, you know, they were too busy doing things and they weren't involved. And I, I was extremely involved in my son's life. I was room mom. I volunteered in the classroom. Um, took him to sports, which he was very active in. Um, did get-togethers with friends all the time. Um, really close with parents you know I sat on the the board not the board the the PT um, parent teacher fellowship at school any event at school I volunteered for you know I was constantly around him and, and when he you know was with other friends I was calling and checking up on him like we were very very close and um, as he became I guess a teenager he got curious and he always had a little bit of a curious side and a little bit of a wild, I don't want to say wild, but maybe a little, you know, mischievous side, like where he just, you know, I would be like, don't touch the stove, don't touch the stove. And it's hot, you're going to burn yourself. And he would walk up and touch the stove just to see for himself. So he was that. He always had to learn from trying things. And as much as I sat on the board of um, when we lived in Scottsdale, Arizona, I sat on um, a board, um, an auxiliary board for Not My Kid, which he was young, but I just got involved in for philanthropic reasons. Um, and it was a organization that taught parents about drugs and what to look for in children and stuff like that. So Weston heard from a very young age about not doing drugs and how dangerous they were. Um, I think that by the time he was a freshman in high school, he wasn't in the Christian school anymore. We did put him in a very nice private school uh, for half a year. 
and then we moved him over into public. And he went from a really small school to over a thousand kids per grade. And, you know, I think there was a lot of social um, pressures to, you know, he was started to hang around with kids who really liked to go out and have fun. And um, I didn't allow him to go to most things, but there was one kid that all the kids gravitated towards. And I know he was drawn to him. And this kid saw my son. I think he saw him as a vulnerability because he knew that, you know, everyone wanted to be his friend. But my son um, kind of, I, I feel like, wanted to impress this kid. And I think this kid, you know, saw him as a client. <laughs> and he, wow. gave, he, he gave him something. Um, and you know, hoping to maybe, you know, Weston, you know, trying to maybe be cool or, you know, um, kind of gain their appreciation or not appreciation, their, um, their friendship. You know, I think he gave into peer pressure. Um, I was told that this kid was constantly going up to my son and my son at some points would tell him to go away, but he wouldn't leave him alone. And, um, it got to a point where he didn't want anything, you know, really to do with this one person. But I think in the, in a big party environment, my son succumbed to peer pressure. And as much of a life of success and built a successful future for him and everything that we did, you know, tutors, I just even think we just got his braces off and, um, you know, just, all the investments we put into him in a moment, he was gone because he wanted to impress somebody and, um, or he wanted this group of friends and it's just a loss that you, you know, you can't imagine because he was everything, you know, he was, he was our whole life. He was our world. And he was my other kid's big brother and their mentor. And two years later, my eight-year-old still asked me questions and, you know, he was crying the whole way to a birthday party yesterday because he misses his brother. And my daughter was real close and my, my other son was, you know, the closest, you know, in age to him. I, I miss him. He was everything to them. And all because of peer pressure and just succumbing to one moment. Now, my, I don't believe my son knew what he was doing. Um, only, you know, you know, you think you're doing one thing and the, the dangerous thing with fentanyl is you're not doing one thing you're, um, that you think you're doing. Like if you think you're taking a Xanax, you're taking pure fentanyl that's packaged up to look like Xanax. If you think you're taking a Percocet, which is a pain pill that, you know, they even give children. Um, I never allowed my kids to take pain medicine um, because I know how dangerous it is, but and I had taken it when I had C-sections for my children, but the last C-section, I didn't even take it just because I just, I didn't like the way it made me feel. It made me feel stupid. So I am, um, I'm not a big pain pill person, but my son took supposedly a quarter of of something, a pill that was supposed to be a Percocet, and it wasn't, it was pure fentanyl. Oh, man. So, um, and I'll never understand why he thought that was smart after everything he learned. But, um, but I can't, I, I can't tell him, I can't get mad at him and say, you know, what were you thinking? He's not here, I can't. Mm -hmm. wake him up in the morning and give him a hug and I can't help him plan his college or his future or, you know help him through things with girls um I I it's a whole life a whole future that was just incredibly he had every opportunity in front of him for a successful future and it's all gone everything we built up for him and in in a snap and I think the lesson that I would like parents to know is that this could happen to your kid. Mm -hmm. um, it's in marijuana. 
there are kids so in my generation nobody ever did cocaine or anything like that but it's very popular these days with kids from what i have learned and there was a girl recently um in the town next over who did a line of cocaine at a party she was young i think she was 16 and she was dead in an instant um wow yeah um marijuana i've met parents now whose kids smoked marijuana that was laced um and you know it they you know if it's in it and they put it on their lips and they get it you know ingest it or if they, what however they get it into their system you know just from smoking marijuana um, then wow. I know that people are like, my kid would never do that. But I want every parent to think back to high school and college. And um, I would say, you know, a large percentage of people have tried marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a smaller percentage have probably tried doing something else. I mean, I know in my day, everyone was popping ecstasy. And, you know, I thank God that I was not ever into anything like that. A lot of people love, and I watched a lot of people do stuff. If you did that nowadays, you die. Yeah, you don't know what you, you don't know what else is mixed with it. That's the problem. No, and to compare it, and this is why we fight so hard at LVOF and um, many organizations to call it a poison, is because when you think you're doing a Percocet, which is extremely yeah, you know, stupid but it's not going to kill you to take a Percocet. It's not, you know, most people know that you can take a pain pill and it won't kill you. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not really a Percocet and it's fentanyl, it's like being laced with cyanide. And actually yeah. fentanyl is even more potent and more, more deadly, more lethal than cyanide if you put cyanide and fentanyl next to each other and weight it, you know, if it was the same weight, fentanyl is more lethal. Fentanyl is a more lethal drug than cyanide. That's incredible. Yeah. So um, to compare it, if you go to a bar and you order um, a drink, you know, maybe a shot of whiskey mm -hmm. and and you drink it and then you drink more and you drink the whole bottle and you die. We call that an overdose because you're intentionally drinking something that you're getting and you died from it by mistake and it's usually accidental. That's an overdose because you know what you're doing. But if you went to that bar and you ordered one shot and it was a brown liquid and it had cyanide in it and you took that one shot and died, you were not overdosing you were poisoned to death and that is the exact same thing that's happening with these pills and you know these drugs that these people are doing is that they're being intentionally poisoned the drug dealers are hoping to hook them and um get them hooked for a little while um but many people die especially children first time they try it because they're not opioid dependent and they can't their systems can't take it their little tiny systems can't handle it and they that's a really good analogy that you just gave thank you for sharing that I, I would not have thought of it that way but you're absolutely right yeah so fentanyl is extremely evil um the people who deal it are disgusting human beings um they know it's fatal uh they know it kills and um and they know that once they hook someone, they will never, once they give it to them one time, they have a client until the, until death. Now, so many people ask me, why would you deal a drug that you know is gonna kill someone? Well, there's several reasons for that. Is because every time you get someone to try it one time, they're hooked. They're gonna have a stream of income and maybe some of those streams will drop off, but there's so many more coming in. It's gonna be a constant stream. And in every drug bust, like the one we just saw in Michigan that could have killed every citizen in Michigan um, two times over, I'll show you $40 million reason why, or I'll show you a million dollars reason why. When you see these drug busts, there's always a million dollars in fentanyl, $200,000 in fentanyl. They're not, 
they know it kills people, but they're not starving for money by any means. People, there's, there's a demand. Um, I would say probably a lot of people who um, are probably older and addicted can probably handle taking it for a longer period of time without death. But when you do fentanyl one time, it is not a matter of if you are going to die. It is a matter of how long it's going to take. Wow. Because you do it one time, you will probably never, ever recover from that first time. It's 50 times more addictive than crack. And I want people to hear that again. It's 50 times more addictive than crack, which crack, we know that if you try one time, you're addicted. And that was the whole thing in the 80s and 90s is crack is whack. You do crack one time, you are addicted. You do fentanyl one time. There is no turning back. I would say um, the chance of recovery after you've gone into rehab is still slim to none. Wow. Uh, there are people that have flatlined and been brought back to life um, and beaten it uh, only to go out and do it again, knowing that it can kill them, knowing that they were on the brink of death and whatever it is in it rewires your brain it makes you feel like you need it. The withdrawal symptoms are, a, you know, make chemotherapy mixed with your worst hangover, a picnic in the park. The withdrawal symptoms are so painful. Bone aches, uh, headaches, um, you know, stomach issues, you know, just really pain in your, in your stomach. Um, just the things that you couldn't even imagine, the only way to relieve it is by taking a little bit more and a little so bit more. What is the time of um, detox for someone who chooses to go to rehab? Two to five years. Uh, to oh. say that you won't do it again. To say no, it's probably no. safe. I, I, I just meant like how long do the symptoms last, the withdrawal symptoms? That part is what I was asking um, I'm not really sure how long I've heard mixed. I've heard mixed things on that. I don't think many people know because I think most people die, but um, I don't think many people, I don't think many people recover. Um, I've heard a couple weeks, um, I've heard several months, but I know that the rewiring of the brain lasts two to five years and that um, it takes two to five years to never want to do it again. And I've heard that even at that point, it still is always going to be a struggle. Like alcoholism is for al alcoholics when they're around it. Um, it's always going to be a struggle for them. But I mean, we're talking about a very small percentage, like, you know, extremely small. Most most people who try it aren't going to survive it. And if you can be that, you know, few percentage points of person that actually get into rehab and come out and never do it again, I mean, congratulations you are extremely lucky. Um, majority of people will die. Wow. And the drug dealers are so evil. They, for children, they prey on children because children are especially unique in that they don't plan on being addicted. They think they can do something one time, try it and be done. But what you're left with in this, you know, 50 times more addictive than crack um an addiction at a very young age and they're afraid to tell their parents because they've done something wrong mm -hmm. and the drug dealer knows this and so they swoon to help relieve your child's you know painful painful bone aches and headaches and cold sweats and fevers and diarrhea they're there to give them a little tiny pill to relieve that just a little bit, just relieve that, take that edge off. And then you don't have to tell your parents that you've done something wrong. And kids get caught in an addiction that they never intended on having just because they tried something once. And these drug dealers are disgusting. They have a groomer's mentality like, like a pedophile does. And they, they prey on children. Children also, dealing with. children also are very trusting. So they may choose to do something uh, like that because they felt a person was trustworthy yeah they do and um these drug dealers know exactly what they're doing they've been trained on how to manipulate the psychology of it they know how to bring them in 
Uh, it's disgusting. And, and, and some of these drug dealers are, you know, peers. And they're mm-hmm. really good at what they do. And every single one of them should be behind bars for murder uh, or attempted murder if they sell fentanyl. Um, it is a weapon of mass destruction. At any point, someone could kill an entire population around them by blowing it into the air where people are walking by. I mean, it's that disgusting. And we are doing zero, and I mean zero, about it. Everyone's like, well, they should have, you know, signed the border bill. It had nothing to do with fentanyl. We have hundreds of machines that detect fentanyl sitting in a closet that aren't being used. The only thing in the bill in February it had was fentanyl detection machines. Why? So we could throw them on the pile with all the other fentanyl detection machines? We need some serious legislation. Death penalty if you kill a child. Death penalty if you kill a child in all 50 states. That's non-negotiable. If you knowingly sell something that kills a child, death penalty. And for people who, you know, this is what Sarah Huckabee Sanders did. For people who, you know, um were older and you know they a drug dealer kills them first time first time uh death they get go into to jail is what sarah huckabee sanders bill said they go to jail for life in prison um to kill an adult um and if it's a second offense i'm not sure i, I believe that there's a death penalty for a second offense of death um, and it will stop people in their tracks from selling it the problem is, is that we don't criminalize people anymore. I mean, you have a state like California, which is such a joke. When people get caught with, you know, 200 fentanyl pills or 500 fentanyl pills, they get, you know, a court date to come back and they're over the Mexican border the next day and they're not coming back to court and they get away with it. And so we're not doing anything. It's intentional. The cartels are running the show. Um, you know, they know what they're doing. I believe they're running our elections. Um, we had a politician recently get bribed on a hot mm-hmm. mic um, by someone who said the cartels are asking you to step back. They're going to reward you handsomely. And she had the whole thing caught on hot mic and uh, she released the hot mic. And the person said this, the cartels are running all the states. I mean, there's a reason that these Congress people who make one hundred and seventy four thousand dollars a year are you know, have net worths of, you know, 20, 30 million dollars. It's it's not coming from Congress. And, you know, I don't know that anyone's that good of an investment. No, I don't think so. The the math just does not work. Um, So we do need to criminalize the drug dealers. We need to label this a a weapon. We know that we need to at the border. We need to uh, increase our border security. We need to start you know, really taking um, illegal immigration very seriously. People need to go back to their countries. Wonderful people who come over here with great intentions. I'm sorry, you have to do it the right way. My brother-in-law did it the right way. It took him eight years. Um, he finally got his certificate and it was, you know, an amazing day and he had a big party because he did everything the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people that need to earn their citizenship here and understand that the United States isn't a free for all to just bring, you know, again, I think most people have good intentions coming over here, but there are ones that are very evil and, you know, bring their drugs over and human traffic and, you know, hurt our children, so sell our children, whether your child's 30 or 20 or 15, my gosh, there's one-year-olds, mm-hmm. two-year-olds dying. It's so sad. Um, the largest age group right now of, of people who are increasing in deaths is 14 and under. So wow. um, it, it's, it's really tragic. So they need to, they need to criminalize people. Mm-hmm. They need to, they need some serious legislation. This is, this is, this is war on human, on, on, on American soil. They fought harder to get ivermectin and uh, hydroxychloroquine from being prescribed for COVID than they are doing to to fight fentanyl, which is killing over a hundred thousand Americans a year. Well, mainly, yeah, mainly people under the age of thirty, but it's the largest. It's the number one killer of people eighteen to forty five. Uh, quickly becoming the number one killer of teenagers, even quickly becoming the number one killer of children, because of people who use it near children or children touch a surface where there's been 
you know, drugs cut on it and mm -hmm. they die. And there was a babysitter who was passing it back and forth um, to their friend and the baby was in the middle and the baby died just because um, they got secondhand smoke. Wow. Up. So, I mean, and this is not like, just doesn't happen once in a while. This isn't that one baby. This is happening every single day. There are 300 Americans dying every day. This is bigger than 9-11. We're doing nothing. This is bigger than COVID. I mean, yes, COVID, uh, um, it's not bigger than COVID. I shouldn't say that. I think that more people they say die from COVID, but I think if we really, you know, tallied up those numbers, um, of all those car accidents that people were dying in that they were counted as COVID, I would argue that this is deadlier um, at this point of an epidemic than COVID because we've had hundreds of thousands of people die from fentanyl. Um, it's more than car accidents. It's more than cancer. It's more than gun violence. Um, it's the number one killer, 18 to 45. I mean... Nothing is being done. It's not like like it's not like it's something that can't be done. Like we can put rules for for driving, but at the end of the day, you know, if a deer runs out in front of your car, it's uncontrollable. You know, this is something we can control. We can mm -hmm. stop these deaths. We can stop these parents crying and losing children, children with bright futures that we've invested everything into. Something can be done, and nothing is being done. We had a bill recently in California go through that would have criminalized fentanyl dealers and 100% of Democrats voted it down, 100%. There was no pork in the bill. There were no special interests in the bill. It was face value, criminalize people who push fentanyl and they voted it down. It is disgusting. It is ridiculous. And this country really needs to get it together because it could be their kids next. And actually it was for one Congressman recently and um, nothing's being done, nothing. It seems that our country has taken this position of no consequences for things that you do, and that doesn't work. You, life is not without consequences to your choices, and our government does not seem to understand that. But I don't think our government cares about anything, personally. <laughs> I well, think they just, they're just, they're, they're serving themselves at this point, and they're trying to put all their buddies in all the right places. Um, and they don't care about uh, our children dying. Um, I, I, am, I have my own views on politically on all that, so um, I can go into that, but since this is um, a discussion on fentanyl, I'll try to stick to that, but I personally, you know, don't feel like they care about us. I mean, they're, letting, they're letting illegal immigration happen for votes. <laughs> I mean. Well, that's part of it, but there have been some conversations about it's really a bigger picture than that. It's more of a path toward globalism that a lot of people think is a good idea. Do you, and so our enemies are attacking us and it's coming in various forms, fentanyl being one, one of them, and our government is not doing anything. And to me, that makes them complicit. And it's not one party or the other. It is the uniparty that is in D.C. that's complicit in, in various people's opinions. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I, I totally think that there's a uniparty. I, I, I mean, I think pretty much everyone, you know, who pays attention and isn't brainwashed by the media at this point can see that. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know until we elect the right person who's going to go against that uniparty, we're not going to see any changes. So I personally um, need, think that we need our, our last president back in office because I know that he'll do something about fentanyl. And um, I know that he will do what he says because he's done what he said. So he's tough. He talks about death penalty for the, for the people that sell fentanyl and that's good enough for me to stop it because I have three other children and I don't think they're very different personalities and I don't ever see them being curious like that um but who knows what you know it can start being used for you know if somebody wanted to use it and put it in people's drinks it's like you know to, to make people pass out it could kill them I mean you can fentanyl is so lethal 
and it's so attainable on social media and, you know, on your phone, these kids can order it in two seconds. They could, you know, they could do anything with it. It's only a matter of time before it starts being used as a murder weapon. I mean, it's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's a, a weapon of mass destruction. It absolutely is. It's a chemical, you know, um, it's, it's chemical a chemical warfare. It is. Well, that is similar to what several of our other guests have said and, you know, about, and you've already said it well, but as we, you know, come to a close tonight, I, I would think our action items would be pushing through the legislation you're talking about, deeming um, fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction, as you said, uh, deeming that drug cartels as the terrorists that they are. These are common yes. things. Absolutely. And I didn't even really talk about that. We need to go over to Mexico and those and, and all of those cartels need to go. I mean, this is a war. It's a war on America. So it's time for us to go back and retaliate. And I'm sorry, the Mexican government is doing nothing, but it's time. It's time to take out the cartels in Mexico. We can do it. Totally agree with you. And you've given us some great information tonight. Thank you very much for coming on with us. Uh, we are Deeply sorry for your loss of Weston and pray that you and your family continue to heal from that. So thank you for being on with us and um, hopefully we'll see you back again sometime. Thank you. Mm -hmm.